We've been in this series entitled Outbreak, and uh, I submit to you we will not uh, study the entirety of the book of Acts, but what we seek to do here as we are studying the book of Acts is to see not only how God has caused outbreak, how God has caused this, this, uh, this barrier to break and the waters of the gospel to go forward out into the known world, but how God intends for us individually to break free, for us individually to break through the barriers that prohibit us from being all that God intends us to be. Here in chapter number eight of the book of Acts, you find as, as we begin the chapter that the apostle Saul, or rather who, the apostle Paul, who was uh, formerly known as Saul, is there um, consenting, witnessing the death of Stephen. The fact that here's a man who so desperately believed this gospel message, he was willing to give his life for it. And it struck a chord in the heart of, of Saul, who would later become the apostle Paul. And so I'm submitting to you that God intends to use your life, the difficulties, the adversities that you face, the challenges and things that you go through as a testament, as a reflection of God's sovereignty and his ability to do great things in adverse times. God is not restricted or limited by the struggles that we face. And God is indeed, he enables us, he permits us to break forth, to break out into all that he has called us to be. And so I want you to look at your neighbor again and say, neighbor, you can't stop me. You can't stop me. You can't stop me from being what God called me to be. You can't stop me from doing what God called me to do. You can't stop me from from, from walking in the promises that God said in his word. And it's not because I'm some somebody. It's because God's a big somebody. And if God be for me, who can be against me? If God be with me, it doesn't matter who's against me or who forsakes me because God is on my side and I am on his side. And so I submit to you that if you are following Following Jesus, if God is on your side and you are on his side and God indeed walks with you, you don't have to be worried about what other people will say, about what other people will do, about how things, circumstances may befall. We know that God is in control. And so the first thing I want you to write down this morning is there's, there's this thing that, that, that this word used in the text, the Bible says, that they were scattered. And I want you to write down scattered in sovereignty. Scattered in sovereignty. The church planted becomes the church persecuted in order to become the church portable. Let me say that again. The church planted becomes the church persecuted in order to become the church portable. L- let, me, let me help you. I'm going to give you an illustration here that I think will help connect some of the dots. But, but, but here's, here's one of the dangers that come from a, a, an organization, in this case the church, an organism that is not moving. It tends to adopt this elitist mentality. You see, it tends to take on this mindset that it's perfect and that nothing should change. Everything should stay the same because in these current conditions, it's perfect and it is advantageous to me. If you go and you look at the, his, the history of Israel, Israel is, is ushered into a land that they themselves did not create, a land that they themselves did not cultivate. They're ushered into a land that God has prepared for them. God has blessed them and kept them, and he is intended to do so, not just so that this nation could habitate and enlarge and become this elite nation. What he does is he moves Israel into the center of the planet so that all of the neighboring nations would see God and would come to know God and experience the salvation that is only in God, that is in Christ Jesus. And so here the local church has grown by thousands. And I believe they've become content to hang out in Jerusalem. You ever ever been around people who don't like change? We want things to Stay the way they've always ever been. But here's the truth of the matter that while God doesn't change, everything else changes. Some of you have experienced the changes in your body. 
There's certain things you used to could do that now you can't because of changes. There's certain places now where you will and won't go because of changes. There's certain things that you will and won't do because of changes. And so the world around us is always changing. And here's the reality. While God never changes, God is not content that we do not change. God is conforming us, the Bible says, into the image of his dearly beloved son, into the image of Jesus Christ. And so how many of you have completely metamorphosized into the, uh, the adequate and sufficient image of Jesus Christ by show of hands if you have become the perfect example of what 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 a relationship with God what loving God and loving people looks like I want you to raise your hand and I want you to say hey I'm done the truth of the matter is as you look around the room there isn't a single hand raised because none of us are done God intends to continually metamorphosize and change and transform our lives so that we will adequately reflect Jesus and so you're not done yet You don't get the right to stand before God and say that I will not change. I will not be moved. The only reason you will not be moved is because God is not moved. In other words, and that that doesn't mean you won't be changed. It means that the place, the position that you have in Christ cannot be altered by behavior by somebody else. That no one can take what God has given to you. And so I'm submitting to you that while God doesn't change, you and I must change. And so the church becomes this elite group of men and women who have the truth. They have the right Bible. They have the right word. They have the right doctrine. They have the right standards. They have the right systems. And they become this elitist group. And God says, not so. This is not my intention for the local church. This, in fact, is what happened to the nation of Israel. They became a nation that was so unwilling to change. They were so unwilling to allow God to mold and shape their life. They, they, they failed to realize that there was an adversary molding and shaping their life. Let me help you get this. You will be changed. The question is, who will change? you will it be Jesus who changes you or will it be the influences of this world that change you let let, let me let me help you understand something all art is an expression and is intended to influence the mind and change you Uh, let, let me help you get this the movies you watch the shows that you watch we may think that they're benign But what happens is, as we continue to consume those worldviews, those perspectives, those things find their way from our eye gate into the heart. From the ear gate, the music we listen to, the ear gate into the heart. From from the the experiences, the touch gate, the things that we handle, it finds its way into our heart. And so let, let me help you get this. I, I, I as, a, as, a, as, a, as a younger person, I had this mindset that the best music, the only music, was rap music. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Right? I'm, I'm confessing. I'm being transparent. All I listened to was, was, was rap music. I had a brother who, who uh, have a brother who, 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 who loved rap music, this, this form. And, and let me help you understand what rap music is. It's just a form of expression. While some of us will say, well, that's not music at all, that's horrible music. The truth of the matter is it's just a different form of expression. There are people who express themselves through classical music. They express themselves through punk metal. They express themselves through gospel. They express themselves through rap. They express themselves through jazz. They express themselves through funk. They express themselves through uh, R&B, rhythm and blues. And so I'm submitting to you that in my life, the only exposure that I had was to rap music. And I met this music teacher. And this music teacher is a part of the class. And, 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 and let, me, let, me, let, me help you, let me help you gain context. See, I grew up in a, in a community and I went to, a school, to schools where it was dominated. It was predominantly African-American people. And so that was, that was the culture. That was the music of the culture of that day and of that time. And so I get into this music class and the music teacher is a Caucasian gentleman. And this music teacher, as a part of the class, he forced everybody, as a part of his curriculum, to listen to different types of music. And, you know, when he put on classical music, there were people who said, nah, nobody likes Bach and Beethoven. 
Nobody listens to that. And when he put on jazz music, and when he put on funk music, and when he put on hip-hop music, and, and, and here's what happened. When he put on hip-hop music, I said, he does know about hip-hop music, rap music, and so forth. The truth of the matter is that that experience exposed me to something other than what I had already been exposed to and showed me that what I thought was the best, what I thought was the strongest, what I thought was the most per permeated the most, I was sadly mistaken that many of the musicians who are rappers, they got their music from the hip-hop artists and the R&B artists and the funk artists and the jazz artists. And so let me help you understand something. While we have this richness in the gospel, while the church has been blessed and highly favored while we have all that we have don't forget your history don't forget the people who paid the way the people who made the investments the people who sold into your life who had differences and God's intention is for us to expose people to diversity so that they get a full picture of who God is God can dance to hip-hop God can dance to rap God can dance to jazz God can dance to funk God can dance to those now now Christian hip-hop Christian rap christian funk christian pop god can god is not a singular god with this singular methodology the only the only single method for salvation that god had is jesus but the methodology that ha that god uses to reach people with the gospel is diverse and various and so here's what god does he says you guys have built this city this this habitation where you have taken on the mindset that that it is all about you, that by the thousands, you're, you're going to press Judaism out. You're going to press paganism out, and you're going to proclaim this gospel message. And God says, I'm not trying to establish another place. I'm trying to glorify a particular person. You see, they had got so stuck on Jerusalem that they missed Jesus. Let me help you get this. We can so easily be stuck in a place and miss the person. We can so easily be focused on church and miss Jesus. There are people today in churches abroad who will have gone to church but have missed Jesus. They'll hear the songs but they'll miss Jesus. They'll hear the sermons but they'll miss Jesus. And so what God does is in his sovereignty he scatters the, 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 those who have come to believe the gospel. He scatters them out into the world so that they will carry the gospel with them. God does and allows everything with intention. God's not doing this by mistake. This is not haphazard. The adversity in your life, it is designed to move you into the view of others so that they can be exposed to the artistry of God and themselves be moved. God is trying to move your life so that people will see you, the unique artistry of God, this, this pottery molded by God, this canvas painted by God. God is trying to scatter you. He's trying to use you to go out and reach people because here's the truth of the matter. There will be some people who will be reached by Christian hip-hop. There are some people today whose lives have been transformed by Christian hip-hop. And there are some people whose lives have been transformed by gospel music. There are some people whose lives have been transformed, Brother Tony, by bluegrass music. Christian bluegrass. Some of you are like, never, ever will I ever. Right? But God is not confined to one means and one method to preach Jesus to the world. God uses diversity. He uses his artistry. And he expresses himself in a magnitude of different ways so that the gospel will go forward. If you and I are going to break out of the bondage that prohibits us from being all that God wants us to be, we must be flexible. We must be willing to allow God to work in our lives and use whatever form of, of, of artistry he chooses. And while we may not like bluegrass music, there is another believer who does like bluegrass music. There's another believer who is diverse in the experiences that they bring, in the, in, in the life that they have lived. And so God intends to, by his sovereignty, scatter us with intention and design so that we will proclaim Jesus on the unique canvas that is our lives. So they're, they're scattered in sovereignty, but then they're seduced in Samaria. You see, you cannot secure what is abstract with what is concrete. Let me help you get this. 
you can't buy love with paper money. If you can, tell me where to buy it. You cannot buy joy with coin or currency. You cannot get from God what is abstract with what is concrete. So, so well, let me help you get this. You cannot get salvation by good behavior. God doesn't give you salvation because you go to church every Sunday. Let me make it plain. If, if, if you think, man, I'm in church every Sunday, the Bible says our righteousness is, as it were, our filthy rags. So God's not looking at your righteousness. He's looking at his righteousness, the righteousness that he transfers, imputes unto you. And so, so, so let me help you get this in the text. If you read further into the book of, of Acts chapter number eight, you'll find that there's this man. His name is Simon. His name is Simon Magus. And here, 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 let me help you get this. His name, it means Simon. It is she moan. Those of you who have been with us on, 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 on Wednesday nights, we've been in this study called Grounded and Growing, and we've been talking about the Shema passage, that is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. That is the here passage. Here, O Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. And so, so here, here's, here's what his name means. His name means, in, in fact, it is, it, it is Leah who, when, when she, she, was, she, was, she was teased for not being able to have any children, one of the children that she births, she names him Shimon. In other words, she says, God has heard me. And so here's a guy whose name means that God has heard the cry of another and he is living his life in a way that is completely against God. And he sees the beauty and the power that the apostles, Peter and John, display in, 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 in touching the lives of people and those people believing the gospel. And there, the Holy Spirit, by sign, by, 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 by miracle, taking up residence in the life of those who Peter and John touch. And so here's what Simon says. He follows them and he marvels at them and he says, I'll pay you money for that power. I'll give you money so that I can have the power to touch the lives of people and see the Holy Spirit of God take up residence in their life. Let me help you understand something. Love, joy, peace, meekness, gentleness, goodness, temperance, faith cannot be purchased with money. The, the economy in the kingdom of God is not coin and currency. The economy in the kingdom of God is faith. You want eternal life? You get it by faith. For by faith, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. We get from God what God has in his, in his kingdom, in his world. We don't get it by temporal behavior. We get it by faith. We walk by faith. We, we, we live by faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It is faith toward Jesus Christ. You want love? Have faith. You see, when your faith is toward Jesus Christ, you inherit, you exchange for faith. When you walk by faith and you experience Jesus himself, the Bible says God is love. You experience his love. You experience hope. You experience joy when you walk by faith. You see, faith towards God believes God despite present circumstances and in light of previous proofs. That is how we obtain what is abstract. So let me help you get this. You want to know why I believe that God will provide? Because I've seen God provide. You want to know why I believe that God is love? Because I've experienced the, 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 the magnitude of the love of God. I've experienced God continue to, to, to love on me despite my constant infirmities, my constant failures. There's a God in heaven whose love is not conditional. You want to know why I believe that, that, that there's joy to be had? Because I've seen God, I've seen God give not only joy to me, but I've seen God give joy to others. And you say, well, well, well where have you seen that? Let, let me help you. Let me help you get this. God is a way maker. God makes ways where there's no ways. You don't, want, you don't believe me? Go read the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve, God, or, or before, God creates everything out of nothing. God, God sees Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they sin, and God makes a way out of no way. 
We see God when 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 Cain and Abel uh they, they they Cain kills Abel. We see God make a way out of nowhere, and that way was in the person of Seth. We see that God constantly throughout the Bible in the days of Noah, God makes a way. In the days of Enoch and Methuselah, God makes a way. In the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God makes a way. In the days of Joseph and Moses, God makes a way. In the life of Aaron, God makes a way. In the life of Caleb and Joshua, God makes a way. With the judges, Samson, Samson, Gideon, and Barak, God makes a way. In the life of Samuel, God makes a way. In the life of David, God makes a way. In the in the life of, of Solomon, God makes a way. When David fails with Bathsheba, God makes a way. And so when you wonder, how do I know in the world that God is going to make a way? When I look at the track record of God, I can believe that when I don't see the way, God has always made the way. And the way culminates in the New Testament, in the person of Jesus, when he arrives and he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. If any no man comes unto the Father but by me, you're looking for a way, the way is Jesus. And the only way to get Jesus is not by works, but by faith. You see, God makes a way. But here in the text, you find that Simon Magus is trying to make a way with his money. Can I help you get this? You can't buy your way into heaven. You see, here's one of the reasons why Jesus was so dangerous. Because Jesus couldn't be bought. Jesus was someone who could not be bought. How can you bribe someone who has everything? You see, many times we in our lives, we compromise. You see, there's this temptation that Peter and John have to compromise. See, here, here's what they could have did. They could have said, how much money are we talking? 4000 5000 Come on, you can do better than that. Man, this kind of power? How much money? Come on, come on, Simon. You've been, you, have been, you have been profiting. You've been a sorcerer. You, you, have, you have manipulated the people in Samaria. You have utilized, you have used them. You have used them to the degree that you've made so much profit. You can come off of more money than that. Let's do a million. Can you do a million? And they could have said, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do. Hey, John, don't worry. John would have been like, Peter, what are you doing, man? We, we, we can't sell this power to him. Hey, no, don't worry about it. We're, we're gonna, we're, we got this. Here, man, just, is the money in the account? Just check. Did the, did the wire transfer clear the account? Okay, we're good. All right, come on in here, Simon. And here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to just put our hands on Simon. We're just going to touch Simon, and we're, we're, we're going to do all kind of crazy stuff just to create this experience, and then we're going to tell him, you now have the same power. Right? We're going to come in here. Everybody, just come on. Everybody, just come on up to the front. We're going to put our hands on them, and you're going to pray, and then you're going to pray, and then you're going to pray, and then we're going to just, we're all going to shake, and we're going to gyrate, and we're going to do all kinds of stuff, and then we're going to say, there it is, Simon. You've got this power. Now go out and touch the lives of others. You see, we tend to compromise. There's so many people who sell their soul for riches. They compromise for image. They compromise for prestige. They compromise for affluence. They compromise for power. And I'm submitting to you that the power of God, the transformative power of God, is not a purchasable power. It is a power that we do not wield. It is a power that we yield to. It is a power that we surrender to. And it is a greater power than all the powers of the earth. It is a greater power than the atomic bomb. It is a greater power than the the United States government. It is a greater power than all of the nations combined. The power of God. And God's going to prove to us that his power is greater than every power. When Jesus comes and his feet touch the Mount of Olives. And he puts all principality under his feet. And he subjugates and subdues all of evil and he brings in ushers in this millennial reign he's going to show the world that he has all power you see don't compromise don't compromise you want to break out don't compromise there are people who have compromised their convictions they're engaged in relationships that do not honor God because of compromise they've embezzled money because of compromise They've lied and they've cheated because of compromise. They've, what, they've allowed their houses to fall apart because of compromise. And I'm saying to you today, don't be seduced by Simon of Samaria. Let me put it this way. Don't be seduced by Satan. You remember Satan when he came to Jesus? He said, if you would but fall down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. 
here's something interesting. Notice Jesus, when he engages Satan, doesn't say, Satan, you can't give that to me. Satan, you don't have the power to give that to me. That's not what he says. He, he rebukes Satan. He realizes that it's, it's not about it's not about this. It, it, it's, about, it's about Jesus. It, it's, it's about the kingdom of God. It's not about our ability to, to, to do what, what, what Satan is calling us to do. It's about whether we'll surrender to God. And so I'm submitting to you, don't be seduced. Don't allow Satan to convince you to compromise your convictions for wealth, for money, for power, for prestige. You see, some of the reasons why we are unable to outbreak, we're unable to go into what God has called us to is because we haven't yet developed the character necessary to be able to walk in what God has shown us ahead of us. Listen, let me let me say it this way. If you can't manage a thousand dollars, you can't manage a million dollars. So if you're wondering why God won't give you a million dollars. It's not because God's this evil, tyrannical person. It's because God's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. He's more interested in making you into the reflection of Jesus than he is in giving you a bunch of stuff. And so if we are going to inherit the love, the joy, the peace, the meekness, the self-control, the gentleness that God intends for us to have by his spirit, it will not be with dollars and cents. It'll be with faith. Don't be seduced by Samaria. So not only is there this being scattered in the sovereignty of God, is there this, this, this compromise, this, this intent to cause the apostles to compromise and be seduced in Samaria. The last part of the chapter, chapter number 8, is being saved in the sands. Chapter number 8, at the end of this chapter, concludes, and I want you to get this, God scours the earth in search of people who will turn to him. God's looking for people who will turn to him. Just a moment. I just I want to give this to you as we've been in this series. I'm not going to I'm not going to try and get through the, the, what's left of this sermon. I want you to understand something. God's desire is to break you free. To cause you and I to break free from the thing that prohibits us from being what he has called us to be. God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives, and he intends to use us as a canvas to paint the portrait of Jesus in the way that we handle people, in the way that we interact with one another, in the way that we respond to someone, whether they're sick in our service or whether they're our neighbor next door. The intent of this entire series is to get us to to not just sit by and be apathetic. I want you to know something. God wants your neighbor next door to hear the gospel. God wants the neighbor across the street to know about Jesus. God wants that coworker you sit in that cubicle next to. He wants that coworker to hear about Jesus. God wants that person you're standing on the line at Walmart with to hear about Jesus. God wants the people you interact with to know the salvation that is only in Jesus. And we've got to be willing to move beyond our comfort zones, move beyond what's normal for us, and allow the interruptions of God. Allow the opportunity for us to respond when there's change, when things aren't the way we thought they should be. We need to be fluid enough to say, okay, God, whatever you want, I'll do. Wherever you lead, I'll follow. Whatever you say, I'll obey. And so I encourage each of you to allow God to mold and shape your heart. And whatever turn he tells you to make, make it. You won't regret it. I promise you. When you obey God, there's no regrets. I promise you, when you get to heaven, Stephen's not going to say, man, they killed me, and I regret that I did what I did for Jesus. No, he's going to say, I'd do it again if I could. When you follow Jesus, there's no regrets. None whatsoever. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer as we conclude our service. Let's continue to be praying for our dear sister. And let's go out and let's allow God to break us forth, break us out of the rut that we're in. Amen.